Hey everybody, welcome back to Reach Out Reptiles. My name is Garrett Hartle, and in this week's video, I wanna talk to you about five lies that I hear all the time regarding food schedules and Superdor free ticks. Okay, so maybe that was a little bit clickbaity. These may not actually be lies. They probably are true in one sense or another, but they don't really apply to super dwarves, and I see people applying them incorrectly all the time. So I thought this would be a great video to separate fact from fiction on exactly what is best for these guys. Okay, so the first one is food input should dictate the size of the animal. If the whole thing about super dwarves was not feeding them to keep them small, why on earth would you pay more for one in the beginning? While it may be true for some species, for example, let's say a mainland reticulated python, where you can probably feed it less and have it stay fairly small, or feed it a ton and have it get really big, there's definitely gonna be a healthy range within its genetics. If you push to the extreme of either end, it's not going to be healthy. Feed this thing the absolute prime diet for optimal nutrition, and you let his genetics and selective breeding do all the work of determining his size. The animal that you, hi buddy, you want them to be very athletic so that they can strike at your face while you make a video and you spook them by suddenly picking them up. The build of an animal should be something like this newborn animal who's only really had one meal. One of the things you should notice about these animals is that they have a wide head, a thin neck, the, the cross section of the body is almost vertically rectangular. You can see that the, that rectangle is formed by kind of the triangle of the spine and the ribs and built up on the two corners with like the back strap uh, of muscle going down both sides. You ideally want a very well muscled animal that doesn't have very much fat on it. That's the optimal way to be feeding a super dwarf reticulated python. You really don't want something that's too skinny where you can see the backbone hanging out and the, the skin begets, begins to become loose, wrinkly, and even thinner than natural as the animal's body absorbs nutrients from its skin and organs to try and stay alive. And on the other hand, you don't want something that's so obese that it ends up looking like it has a tiny little pinhead on this huge body because you have fat reserves stuffed from neck down to tail on the animal. Hey everybody, Garrett Hartle here, not at Reach Out Reptiles. Today I'm actually in the Utah desert and I still wanna to talk to you guys about Stuart Design. See, you never know in what kind of random situation you're gonna be in when you meet somebody of great importance to your business. Well, hi there, my name's Owen. Welcome back to my channel that you think really could use your contact information. When that happens, you would want said person to remember who you are. Well, hi there. How are you guys doing today? I'm here at the hotel. Has always got my back with a professional logo, cards that stand out, that are really well printed. Hey Rattlers, what's up? So that lake right there is one of Minnesota's most famous lakes in a huge variety of different design choices. So go check them out today, and thank you very much for supporting the people that support this channel so we can bring you guys awesome content. These are stinking rad. You could have said that during the video. Misconception number two. My super dwarf is acting hungry, I should feed it. Let me tell you, super dwarfs will always, always eat. 
They do not know what is best for themselves. They are programmed in the wild to be opportunistic and grab at anything that comes along. Stack up some calories now, they may not be available later. A baby Superdorf retic, once it develops a good feed response, would literally eat every single day if you allowed it. Not only that, hunger and the need for food are two entirely different things. You ever get hungry right at noon and you're so starving and your body is telling you it's lunchtime and you think, oh, I'm so hungry, my body needs calories. But if you push past that, you, you work a little later, whatever the case may be, and suddenly at two o'clock, you're not hungry anymore. That's because your hunger response is based onto a schedule that you have. Reticulated pythons are very intelligent and they also live on schedules. In other words, if you fed a snake every Saturday night, it would be hungry every Saturday night. If you fed it every single night, it would be hungry every single night. That doesn't mean either one of those is correct or incorrect. It just means your snake is gonna eat food. And yes, they always want food. If I ask my kid if they want candy, they always say yes. Speaking of routines, the third misconception that I hear all the time is that a snake should just eat every single week. So many keepers feed a snake based on their calendar schedule. Like, for example, it's Saturday night. I don't have to work. This is the night I go into my reptile room, so this is the night that I will feed my animals. Makes it easy for us as keepers to have a consistent schedule for them eating, but this is not the way that it is in the wild. The fact of the matter is, with a young retic, as it grows, they need to consume food more often, but they also have a very high metabolism so that they can pull the nutrients that they want out of it and get rid of the rest and put it in towards growth. As they get older, the food is probably not as readily available to them on a regular basis in the wild. They're either going to be taking frequent small meals that are available or an occasional big meal that they're happy enough to take down. So in captivity, the better way to feed an animal is based on its caloric needs for growth or breeding. And these can change throughout the life of the snake. So while a hatchling snake like this guy really might need to be fed once a week, by the time he's three years old, if I kept feeding him a big meal once a week, he's going to start to get pretty fat. Now, speaking of big meals, misconception number four is that you should go ahead and feed a super dwarf a really big meal because they can take it. It's true that they have ridiculously amazing digestive systems and are capable of taking down large prey items. I mean, a super dwarf retic is usually so happy that you've opened a tub and put a warm blooded prey item in front of it, it'll grab it first no matter what it is, and it may not have the good sense to stop after trying to swallow an animal that's stretching it out to gargantuan proportions. Heck, half the time my little super doors try to eat me. So excited. <laughs> Just because the snake thinks it can handle that size prey item doesn't mean that it can. The fact of the matter is that while they may encounter large meals occasionally in the wild, they don't need to have the risk that it places on their bodies to tax their digestive system that much. That's definitely a gamble that a wild animal may need to take if it doesn't know where its next meal is coming from. In captivity, it's perfectly acceptable to feed an animal a meal that's a little bit larger in the food items girth than on the girth of the snake. That's gonna be a comfortable size meal and a comfortable frequency is gonna depend on whether the animal is growing, whether it doesn't really need that energy for growth anymore. Is it at a particular place within the breeding cycle? Now, sometimes you can give it a little bit larger or smaller meal just to change things up a bit. And that brings us to misconception number five. Fluctuating in the diet is bad. Fluctuation is completely natural. And while it is easy for us with our calendar-based schedules to feed consistent sizes on consistent intervals, it's not really the way that these animals are designed to take down prey. The, the simple fact of the matter is that if you fed it double one week, and then skip three weeks, it would be completely healthy on the animal. It would actually be just as healthy as it is for you or I to occasionally fast for a meal or have some sort of a cleanse in our diet. In fact, giving that animal's digestive system an occasional rest and, and chance to cleanse itself and relax from dieting is a very good thing, even if your snake is acting hungry and upset at you for doing so.
And finally, to wrap this up, I just want to give you guys one bonus tip that, uh, you know, a lot of times people ask me about the science behind the diet of their super dwarfs. And my answer is always the same. Feeding and keeping an animal well has some science to it, but it really is the art of herpetoculture that is going to benefit these animals. In other words, understanding your animal, studying what it should actually look like when it's healthy, trying to replicate what they have in the wild, gathering those scientific facts, but then artfully applying them to having a healthy, well-balanced diet for your animal is going to be the best possible scenario for you. All right, guys. Well, that's it for us this week. I hope that this has been informative to you. And again, I would just encourage you guys to learn the art of a beautiful, natural form of a reticulated python as it was designed to be, and that that would always be your goal when dictating how you're gonna feed your animals. Thanks for tuning in. We'll catch you guys next time.